Hey lovelies, I wanted to talk with you today about tarot obsession. I have a bit of a tarot obsession and uh, I'm curious about what it is, what it means, how to work with it, and I wanted to share that with you and also I'm curious about your tarot obsessions. <laughs> to respond to this tag, please do, or just respond in the comments below. So my tarot obsession is this tarot deck, the Tarot of the She. Um, and I, <sighs> this deck has a hold on me that really defies my understanding. It's, uh, there's something that has grabbed me from the very first moment when I first became acquainted with this deck, which might have been uh, it wasn't, this deck came out in 2010. It wasn't when it came out. It was much later. It was actually after I had started my attempt to bring my Zen practice, my mindfulness work, and my tarot interests together through Mindful Tarot. So it was after 2015. Um, I say that knowing be that because this deck has been on my tarot altar since my tarot altar has existed. And I didn't create a tarot altar until after 2015. So I'm talking to you now from the room that I know as initially knew as my Zendo, as my little meditation, my little meditation hall, my little meditation studio. I'll, I'll plop a picture of what this room originally looked like before I finished it out. And then it became sort of embellished with um, a more elaborate uh, uh, Buddha altar. And then it acquired after 2015, a tarot altar. And there are also two other altars and now, you know, storage for my tarot cards. And so this is like my shrine room, my tarot studio, the place I do my Zoom calls. I have a low table just over there with my, uh, with my uh, big computer set up for Zoom. I see clients in this studio. It's, it's kind of, it's, tarot sd zen -y central i meditate right over there it's all it's all in here okay which is weird but i love it even though it's less of that beautiful zen open space that it, that it was when i first created it so this deck has been on my tarot altar since i've had a tarot altar which is weird because i don't read with this deck but there's something about i think something about the she energy that fairy energy in it. Um, and to be honest, the reason I don't read with this deck is because I, <sighs> Schiffer, <laughs> Schiffer, Schiffer cardstock, right? Um, yeah, you, you know, it's the, uh, the cardboardy, I mean, it's got, it's probably, you know, it doesn't have a core, I don't know. It may even have a core, but it just does not feel good. It's shiny, it's cardboardy, it feels like, coasters um and uh and yet you know in the art style the sort of primitive art style like emily card carding sort of self self-taught but also she just painted these images very quickly um in order to let the imagery emerge in the course of her kind of contemplative study of the she um and, you know, she's uh, she is herself coming from uh, a Celtic shamanic tradition. I am not Ashkenazi Jew, Eastern European stock. There's as far as I know, there's no no Celtic anything in me. And yet something about the she seems to grab me. I don't know why. Um, something about Ireland grabs me and I don't really have a good explanation of that. I, I know that many of us feel drawn to places. I don't have a connection to East Asia either, and yet I'm a Japanese Zen Buddhist. So what are those kind of uh, claims on our heart, on our imagination? How do we understand them exactly? For me, there is something in the kind of energies of this deck that has always compelled me, even though... Uh, I hate the cardstock and I, the the kind of illustrative style is not something that I would necessarily say. Oh, this is this is what floats my boat. Some of the some of the cards are like downright just they're they're sort of messy. They're they're hard to read. They're sort of they seem a little chaotic. And yet 
And yet, I'm drawn to this deck. So, um, a while back, uh, <laughs> I formed the idea of creating my own little study deck based on this deck. And I have a video about that. And it's really, it's just, it's very sweet and embarrassing to look back at because the method that I came up with using my iPad and kind of shutter release and kind of trying to avoid the glare of the shiny images, I, I produced a deck that was okay um, by taking those images and sucking them up into uh, make playing card standard size. The deck ended up being uh, just by the nature of the card size ended up being trimmed. This is sort of standard tarot size as opposed to, um, right? So it's trimmed, but, and the images were in some ways, the image remained, I think actually it did remain the same size because I think some of the, mm, are the borders different? Yeah, the, the borders ended up being uh, slightly different and the image aspect ratio slightly different, but by and large, you know, I ended up with the images pretty much the same as they had been, but the titles, uh, many of them, partially cut off not completely cut off but partially cut off and I was like okay this is pretty good it's pretty good the images are clear um the deck is good to go but way led on to way and I haven't really read much with this version of the deck it's just not quite there not quite there oh and I, I left out I had another edition of the mass market that I trimmed and edged um, and then uh, gave away. So, so I've had several iterations of this deck, and somehow keep being pulled back to it, but not, never quite making my way into it. So, a few weeks ago, I realized now I was already sort of getting run down and getting ready to get COVID, which I got, and I've been I'm just on the other end of being sick for over a week. Um, so, yeah, there's that. But in the lead up to my COVID, feeling kind of exhausted, feeling sort of out of sorts in that way when you're coming down with something or you're like you're running down, your energy's running down, the she came back to me and I'm like, I have to make yet another effort to do this deck. And this time I found uh, an app called Photoscan that's on iPhone and Android, and it's designed to turn um, a, your regular smartphone into a uh, easy way to scan images uh, from old photos directly into your photo album. And so it will kind of clean up edges. It will it will do the work that um, I had been trying to do manually with my iPad. Just suck those images in, square them, have them get them all nicely aligned. And so it seemed like I found the answer to scanning these cards in. I don't do Photoshop, right? Like I know there are tons of you out there who have lots and lots of skills. Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Um, terror of terror obsession, right? I'm both obsessive and also lazy or, uh, just malad maladroit. I just can't. So there I was like crouching on the floor, photographing with my iPhone card after card after card, sucking it into my photo album and then uploading it into make playing cards. And I chose a, a jumbo size card, um, Right, so this is the original glossy Schiffer, and this is the cardstock I chose, and sucked the images in, and ended up with cards that look like this. Um, this is that beautiful Superior Smooth Make Playing Card cardstock. is just a joy to hold and touch. It it shuffles beautifully, and the cards were slightly trimmed on the side. Uh, the borders were remained uh, their uh, sort of natural ratios. The images were enlarged. Let me see if I can do apples to apples here and show you um, Maker 6. And so there you go. Now, I did not have the capacity because I'm just working with an iPad and, and a computer and, you know, nothing, no fancy technology. So I didn't have the opportunity to really balance the colors. So you'll see that the original is, is much sort of... Um, a uh, brighter, warmer tone and more saturated. I just did my best. But the detail's nice and sharp. 
the cards are legible, and the cardstock is wonderful. Now, for some reason, the whole suit of uh, the cups of Dancer, um, when I photographed those cards, the lighting was slightly off, so you'll see that the black is really terrible. So that's a major fail. <laughs> and there are other fails as well. Some of the cards have more and some have less uh, border. Some have no border at all. Let me see one, like for instance, uh, the Ace of Fire, the Warrior card. Compare that with uh, the the border on the 10, the Wheel of Fortune, which is uneven. I mean, this is a sh I, this is a shitty deck too. I like totally, you know, but, um, but it was somewhat labor intensive and it was expensive. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Tarot obsession. So on the other hand, it shuffles like a dream and it's uh, a nice large size. And so now I think what I want to do is to read with it with you, my first reading with this new version of the deck. And really, again, this is also that question of terror obsession. Like, does this deck bless my efforts? Like there's something I'm trying to respond to. There's something, there's some call from the she, from this deck, from Emily Carding's deck. There's some call here that, that I'm feeling and I'm trying to respond to it. And so I, it feels like this, uh, compulsive activity. <laughs> Compulsions are not a great thing, I know. And yet there's something precious and valuable here. So have I met the call of the she? That's kind of what I want to know. Um, and in asking that question, I'm also trying to understand what the call of the she is. What is, what is this deck trying to pull forth? And can I get there? with this iteration, with this modification, with this uh, make playing cards response to uh, a deck that I've now bought the mass market version of twice <laughs> and have tried to create my own study version of it twice is four times the charm, <laughs> I'm wondering. The other thing I wanna say about this deck, so Emily Carding, uh, uh, her her tarot obsession and feeling sort of compelled to make this deck. She was originally, she wanted to stick with the very traditional Rider-Waite-Smith uh, connotations of the cards. That's sort of the, the Rider-Waite-Smith Golden Dawn interpretation of the suits. So she was just, okay, there'll be a fire suit, an air suit, a water suit, an earth suit. She kept the almost entirely, not 100%, but she kept, other than I think the name for the Hierophant, and the name for the devil. The devil is Pan in this deck, and the Hierophant is the Elder. Um, other than those two cards, she kept the names of all the major arcana. But the minor arcana suits, she shifted the names, and she was just going to have it be air, fire, water, and earth. But one morning, she was told, the she informed her, you know, no, the air suit is the suit of dreamers. It's the dreamer suit. The water suit is the suit of the dancer. The fire suit is the suit of the warrior, and the earth suit is the suit of the maker. And that uh, that shift of uh, suit identifications is really quite brilliant and lovely, and it turns the deck as a whole into a deck that's all about uh, the realization of dream, the realization of the inner, the 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 rendering outward of inner intuition and thought. Um, this sense of the suit of water, of, of intuition as uh, the cups, as the suit of the dancer, that uh, complete embodied expression that isn't at the level of, of concept, but is at some more heartful level, I would say. Uh, that recognition of the suit of fire as being not just about inspiration, but about encounter and combat, and that mano a mano relationship to the world, that her heroism of the suit of fire and her seven of, of uh, warriors, uh, her seven of fire suit uh, card is one of the most powerful uh, expressions of that seven of wands 
bodhisattva energy that I've ever seen. And she weaves poetry into her little white book. Um, so for instance, each, um, each of her uh, cards expresses um, a, a quatrain of poetry. So the warrior seven, a hero stands against the odds, her flaming sword raised to the gods. And when they hear her battle cry, the sorry cowards will surely fly. So these uh, quatrains that she gives, let me just get that warrior seven out. Um, the quatrains that she gives are just this lovely uh, intuitive response to the tarot archetypes. And unlike other decks with keywords, her keywords are for me, it's a lot like the um, Margareta Peterson deck. Her keywords for me are, uh, they don't shut down meaning, they open up meaning. Yeah, so here she is, Warrior Seven, a hero's challenge. So um, I, I love this card. So, you know, this, this opening up of the archetype through the quatrain, the two couplets that she puts for every card, through the keyword, through the association with the suit, there's something, there's an energy here that it's my tarot obsession. Um, the other thing that I love about this deck is the way that she works with the court cards. So all of the court cards, she has a, a kind of a standard Golden Dawn -y variation on the, the court ranks. So she has uh, Prince, Princess, Prince, Queen, King, okay, uh, with King at the top of the rank. And then uh, for each of the tarot court cards, she gives a key phrase that aligns them to a gift. So the Maker King, for instance, is the gift of skill. Um, so all of the tarot courts express this sense of the court cards as being uh, endowed with the energy of the suit as a gift. They are gifted, we might say, right? They're endowed with that suit energy, and thus they hold forward that gift to us. I've been thinking a lot lately about the tarot court cards and the ways in which the aces of the suit with that very classic Waite Smith imagery of the divine hand proffering the element of the suit offering us a gift, but that is the gift that is offered to us in the aces is a seed, right? It's the potential. It's the energy of the suit at, in potentia as a seed to be planted. And then that uh, seed, right, uh, comes forth as gift in the personality, in the persona of the tarot court. So I love that each of her court cards uh, have this identification as a gift that they are bringing forward in their own being, in their own persona, in their own personality, the gift of the suit. So we have the maker king is the gift of skill. Uh, the maker queen uh, is, I think, the gift of healing. Um, they each are uh, expressing a gift related an embodied expression of related to the suit uh, that they represent. Yeah, the maker queen is the gift of healing and so forth. And again, I feel like these uh, keywords, these key phrases, unlike keywords elsewhere, they don't shut down meaning, they open up meaning. And I love that uh, identification of the court cards with endowment, with the gift of the suit. Okay. So did I hit it? Did I, did I answer the call of the she? That's going to be my question. Um, and it's sort of like this sense of, is, is the deck mad at me? Like, is it okay? All of the ways in which I've worked with this energy, is this deck mine? Is it wanting to work with me? Um, so I'm sort of, yeah, I think that, you know, iteration number four of the tarot of the she. Uh, how are you, how are you feeling toward me, I guess? Uh, what are you bringing forward? What do I need to know, tarot of the she? Let me just dialogue with you. Do you want to work with me? Have I, have I responded to the call? 
of the she? Have I met the energy of the she? So are you saying, are you saying that you're bringing a kind of um, integration to me and that uh, you want me to sort of allow myself to blend into the energy of this deck, to meet it, to integrate it? Let's see what you say about temperance. Um, so the key words that, that she uses for the majors, um, they don't have, it doesn't have a quatrain here. It has a description. She says, sun within moon, fire within ice. I am the healing waters of the tempered soul. From one comes all and from all I come, the secret balance that must be kept. Life emerges, the sun awakes, and that which seemed opposed finds the key within that which finds the key within that which brings completeness. I am the frost of dawn. I am the sky that melts. I am the stars below and the earth above. I am the formula of renewal. I am blessed winter's rest. I am the world within worlds, the heart within the song. I am the winged messenger of your higher self. I am the inner warrior of your deepest being. I am the alchemy of peace and the precious curative stone within the golden toad. So, yeah, so allowing myself to be pulled into the alchemy of this deck, allowing a blending. Yeah, allowing a blending. Can I let myself uh, blend into the fire, the water of this deck? Am I hearing you right that you're promising a kind of blending? Oh, got some jumpers, but I'm going to. Maker to responsibility. So there is this sense that I have to enter into relationship with this deck. That maybe I've been putting it off. I mean, I certainly in this tarot obsession, I've been like, here's a deck that I'm drawn to, but I'm not going to work with it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's like, okay, just actually work with it. Um, what's being said here about Maker 2? Born from one realm to another, the acorn babe has known no mother, yet holds the power of the two. Where seed is planted lies within you. Yeah. So a sense of needing to give myself to this deck, actually. Um, there's a way that I keep wanting a kind of perfection and temperance is a reminder that, you know, it's not, it's not about, uh, perfection. Um, my, my friend Gil Stafford talks about, uh, the author of the Bible and the tarot just came out. Um, he talks about the way in which temperance is, uh, uh, pouring death into the devil, like this willingness to allow transformation, uh, to happen by um, letting go and entering into the crucible of chaos. Um, there is the, 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 the balance and, and temper that temperance achieves, the, the stability doesn't come from withholding. It doesn't come from holding fast. It comes from a willingness to give in to the chaos, which I think is part of what the she offer. 
Um, they are uh, the chaotic inner radiance of the inner earth. Um, they are a call that is incredibly ancient. That isn't what we think it is. Um, they are earth energy in a way that isn't what we think it is. They are guardians in a way that we don't understand guardianship. And to allow ourselves to be drawn into that is kind of challenging and scary and all manner of things. So I'm going to do one more reading. And this is a significator reading. So one of the things I'm doing this summer is I'm calling significator summer, um, which is to take my card of the month and to do a significator reading where I, after shuffling the deck, I find that card in the deck and I look at the card above it and the card below it as a way of reading the um, calibrating really my card of the month. So my card of the month is the queen of swords, another, uh, another court card. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to remember what the gift is. It might be the gift of sorrow. I'm trying to remember what the Queen of Swords is in this deck. Um, but I'm going to find her. I'm going to shuffle one more time. I love shuffling this, this version of the deck. It's uh have to do a side shuffle like this, but it shuffles really nicely. You can't bridge it, but it riffles well. Okay, so finding the King Queen of Swords. I'm just going to flip over the deck one card at a time until I find the Queen of Swords. She's the gift of reason, the dreamer queen. And uh, maybe I didn't shuffle well, but it is what it is. So she's surrounded by dreamer seven was the card above and dreamer king card below. Dreamer seven, a coward betrays. And dreamer king, the gift of judgment. Yeah, so that gift of reason that the Queen of Swords represents sitting, sitting on a stack of books holding some kind of prickly animal object? Or is it a mask? Maybe she's holding a mask that she's taken off her face. So a coward betrays. So this... Uh, yeah, so that really dark, shadowy version of the Seven of Swords of deceit and uh, um, betrayal, uh, deception, not being willing to show, to be all in, right? Versus, versus on the other side of the gift of judgment. So this does suggest to me the kind of fearlessness that's at stake with the Queen of Swords. Um and a sense of what does it mean to really stand and face it all and to be willing to uh, line up uh, the sword of mind with one's reality. To fully uh, clarify uh, the meaning of one's world and not this hedging of bets, the, the queen of swords, that gift of reason that somehow mediates be between our fearfulness, um, our inability to kind of be with the truth of our experience, and then our fully capable sense of judgment. So about Dreamer 7, she says, at times the shadows in the dream are hidden and from the depths will emerge unbidden. They must be faced, the challenge met, lest dreams be tangled in cunning net. Like face your shadow. It's fucking terrifying. But if you don't, your shadow will uh, cut you in two. Will betray you and what you love. So facing the shadow, the dreamer king, he is the fire within the gale with armor made from dragon scale, and he is known throughout the land for dealing justice with king's fair hand. So once we've faced the shadow, once we've uh, reckoned with uh, the fullest um, cognizance of what lies underneath, what lies hidden in the, in the shadowy dark of our own dreams, then actually we can enter a world that is just and true. Um, that sense of authenticity and authority and fairness that comes with the suit of air. 
the dreamer queen of what she says about the dreamer queen. Her throne is knowledge, true and just. Her mind is all that she will trust. A blade as sharp as any sword and solitude is her reward. So that aloneness of the queen of swords, I mean, it does seem to be the aloneness of, of giving yourself up to the shadows. Maybe. Okay. The tarot of the she, my tarot obsession. What obsesses you? <laughs> I'd love to hear. Okay. Take care. I hope this was enjoyable to watch. As always, thank you so much for your practice. Toodles.